So let's talk about comparisons. The purpose of a comparison in Windows PowerShell is to compare two objects in some fashion and to generate a true or a false result. And this is the most important thing, the true or the false result. Comparisons always generate a true or a false result. Windows PowerShell provides two built-in variables, $true and $false, which represents those Boolean values. And all comparisons result in true or false. Here are the basic comparison operators. They all start with a dash, and by default, they are all case insensitive, which means they're not case sensitive. Dash EQ is for equality, 5 equals 5. Dash NE is for inequality, 5 NE 6. 5 is not equal to 6. GT and LT are greater than and less than, and GE and LE are greater than or equal to and less than or equal to. These are pretty different from the operators used in other programming languages, but there's something you're going to have to get used to. And again, they are case insensitive when they're comparing strings. Let's use the variable $underscore to represent a process. Just uh, think of this variable as a placeholder for a process that's running on Windows. So $underscore.handles-gt1000 will compare to see if the process's handles property is greater than 1000. Or we might check to see if its name property is equal to notepad. Either of those comparisons can be expected to produce either true or false. Or we could just examine the responding property. See, because that property actually is either true or false, we don't actually need to compare it to anything. The end result of a comparison is true or false. If you already have a true or false value, you don't need an actual comparison. So here's a simple comparison of two strings of text to see if they're equal, and they are. I mentioned that these operators are case insensitive, and I can prove that with a quick test. Hello with a lowercase h is indeed equal to hello with an uppercase h. 5 is greater than 10 as shown here, and this ability to quickly evaluate expressions right at the command line is a great way to test expressions to see if they work the way you think they do. Here's a more complex expression. 5 is greater than or equal to 5, and 10 is less than or equal to 100. The first expression is true, and the second is also true. Since they're both true, the total result is also true. Next, 10 greater than 100, which is of course false. The second expression is 100 greater than 10, which is true. The two expressions are joined by the OR operator, so if either of the expressions is true, the total result is true. Since the second expression is true, then the final result is true. So now that you know how to do a comparison, you know how to do filtering in the pipeline too. We're going to use the where object commandlet. It accepts a collection of objects as pipeline input and examines each object one at a time. Only those objects which meet the criteria you specify, which have a true comparison, are passed down the pipeline. In your comparison, in your criteria, you're going to use the special variable dollar sign underscore to represent the current pipeline object. Let's see how that works. Here's what filtering looks like. I'm again starting with get service, which produces several service objects. I'm putting where object into the pipeline to filter out the services I don't want to work with. So where object receives those service objects and filters out the ones that don't meet my criteria. Anything which does meet my criteria is left in the pipeline. Out default is at the end of the pipeline and it receives whatever objects are left. It uses their properties to construct the text list that we see on the screen. Now, here's the same example in a command line. Get service, pipe to where object. The criteria for where object is in curly braces and the dollar sign underscore variable represents the pipeline object under comparison. So if the pipeline object's status property equals running, then the object will be passed down the pipeline. If not, the object is dropped from the pipeline. After filtering, I might pipe the object onto a commandlet like sort object to have them sorted into a different order. Let's start now with a simple command line, get service, stop service. I'm using the dash what if parameter to keep this from actually doing any damage 
and as you can see, it would have stopped all the services on my computer. Pretty damaging. Now let's introduce some filtering. I'm going to start by getting all of the services, but I'm only keeping those with a status of running. In other words, I'm not going to try and stop services which are already stopped. That filtering is accomplished with where object. I use dollar sign underscore to represent the current pipeline object and see if its status property equals running or not. Whatever's left gets piped to stop service, and as you can see here, the results are somewhat different. Fewer services were included in the what if output this time. Let's look at one more real world example now. Get process, but only keep those processes which have a responding property of false. This does take a moment to read. Remember that PowerShell comparisons are anything which results in true or false. It so happens that this responding property of a process is true or false, so I don't need to compare it to anything. The dash not operator reverses true and false, so that only processes with a responding property of false will meet my criteria and be retained in the pipeline. Hopefully, I won't have any non-responsive processes, and hitting enter, I see that I don't. Now, if you need to do a more complex comparison, or maybe you're looking at multiple different criteria and you're going to come out with one super result, true or false, you can use three other operators. Dash and returns true if both comparisons on either side of the and are true. Dash or returns true if either of the comparisons are true. And dash not just reverses true and false. If we use dollar sign underscore to represent a WMI Win32 service instance, I could do comparisons to see if the start mode was equal to auto and to see if the state was not equal to running. If both comparisons result in true, then the total result of this is true. This combined comparison would show me services which are set to start automatically but are not actually running. Now, I'm going to use WMI to retrieve all instances of the Win32 service class from my computer. I'm using where object to filter so that only those with a start mode of auto and which are not started will remain in the pipeline. In other words, services set to start automatically which are not started. That's a list you usually hope is empty, too. Next, I'll use get event log to retrieve the events from the security log. I'm only going to keep those which have an event ID property equal to 4616 or 1108. Any objects remaining in the pipeline will be sorted by their event ID. This can take a while to run if the security log contains a lot of events, but as you can see, the final results are exactly what I asked for, a simple and easy way to filter through the event log without using a GUI. Most commandlets are designed to work with entire collections of objects at once, not just one object at a time. Piping get service to stop service gets all the services and stops all of them. However, you can have the pipeline do more complex things with an object, individual objects, one at a time, by using a commandlet called for each object. Here's an example. What if you wanted to reboot every computer that you had listed in a text file. Now you could use the WI Win32 operating system class to do this because it has a reboot method, but you'd have to reboot each computer individually. You can't just say, here's a bunch of computers, reboot. You have to, have to connect to each one and tell it to reboot. So let's take a look at what that looks like sort of graphically, and then I'll show you the PowerShell script that makes it happen. Here's why you need for each object. Let's say I use getWMIObject to retrieve a bunch of objects which represent the operating system of a remote computer. I need to be able to pipe that to something which will execute the reboot method of each one of those objects one at a time. Now what if I want to do this for a whole list of computer names so that I can reboot the entire list with a single PowerShell command? I'll show you. I'm going to start by reading a list of computer names from a text file. I'll list one computer name per line in the file, and the getContent command will read that file and turn each line of text into an object that I can work with, a collection of string objects to be precise. Now I need to connect to each computer individually, so I need to work with each computer name one at a time. So I'll pipe the computer names to for each object. For each computer name, I want to use WMI to reach out to that computer and grab the Win32 operating system class. 
So inside the for each object script block, I'll put my call to get w my object. Notice that the dollar sign underscore variable represents the pipeline object, which in this case will be a computer name. So I use it as the value for the dash computer name parameter. That WMI query is going to produce some results and I'm gonna to need to work with them. So I'm piping those results to for each object. This second use of for each object is actually nested inside the first. I've uh, formatted the curly braces to try and make this clearer. So in this nested for each object, dollar sign underscore represents an instance of Win32 operating system. So for each one of those instances, I'll execute their reboot method, rebooting the remote computer. The result is a single line that reads a list of computer names and reboots all of them. My next two examples are a bit complicated, so I'm gonna try and walk through them step by step. I'm starting by getting all the process objects on my computer, simple enough. Next, I'm filtering them so that only those with a handles property greater than 1000 are kept in the pipeline. Any objects that meet my criteria are piped to for each object. For each one of those objects, I'm dividing the working set property by 1000 and displaying the result. So if 10 process objects met my filtering criteria, then that division operation would take place 10 times, once for each object that was piped in. Here's a more real world example. I'm using WMI to retrieve all instances of the Win32 NT event log file class. I like to use WMI for this because unlike get event log, WMI can connect to remote computers. Those event logs are being piped to for each object, or rather one of its aliases, the percent sign. That's right, punctuation can be an alias. Now for each log file I get, I'm executing the log files backup event log method. See, this is why get member is such a useful commandlet. It was by piping win32 nt event log file to get member that I discovered the backup event log method. So for each event log, I'm executing that method. Inside the method, I'm specifying a path as well as the event log's own log file name property and then the .evt file name extension. This all becomes the path and file name that the event log is saved as. So in one line of PowerShell, I've backed up all of the event lines on this computer. And by simply specifying a computer name for getWMyObject, I could easily back up a remote computer's event logs. The trick here is to remember that whatever is inside for each object executes once for each object that's piped in. If getWMyObject retrieves four log files, then for each object will execute four times, meaning the backup event log method will execute four times. Each time the dollar sign underscore variable represents the next event log that was retrieved, allowing me to work with them individually. Spend some time studying this example so that you understand what it's doing. This is a real key to making PowerShell really work for you. Please pause this video now and follow the instructions in your lab guide to complete this lab. There are hints in the lab guide if you need them. And try to complete the lab without referring to the solution in your lab guide. When you're done, resume this video and I'll review a sample solution with you. Let's look at the five tasks in lab 8-1 to see how you did. For task one, I run get process and then filter so that only those processes which are responding remain in the pipeline. I sort those remaining objects by name and the results are converted to text by out default and displayed in the console window. For task two, I use getWMyObject to retrieve the Win32 service class and I only keep those which have a start mode of auto and a state which is not running. A useful enough tool, however, you might not want to look at this in the console window. A web page might be nice. So in task three, I pipe my service objects to convert to HTML and then pipe the HTML text to out file so that I'm creating a file. Here's the results in a web browser. As you can see, any objects which were piped to convert to HTML have been converted to HTML format laid out in a nice table. For task four, I start by launching a couple copies of Windows Notepad. I'll minimize those to the taskbar and then run get WMyObject to retrieve the Win32 process instances. I'm filtering so that only those processes with a name equal to notepad.exe remain in the pipeline. 
you do have to specify notepad.exe, not just notepad. I find that out by just running get WMI object Win32 process and reviewing the results to see what sort of names were actually in use. So whatever's left in the pipeline goes to for each object, which executes each object's terminate method. As you can see, the two notepad application windows close immediately. Finally, for task five, I'm retrieving the content of a file called computers.txt, which is one computer name per line in a simple text file I made with Windows Notepad. For each computer name, I'm using get WMI object to retrieve the Win32 logical disk class from the computer name specified by the current pipeline object. The result is a quick inventory of multiple computers' logical disks, all with a single command line.